today to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession. This week's episode is brought to you by Imaging Services, Cairo Thin, Cairo Moguls, Mahalo Wellness, Cairo Health USA, The Goodman Factor, Chiropractic Rocks, Winner's Edge, Cairo Tax Pro, and Digital Hustle. Let's hustle. Hey guys, welcome to episode 204 of the Cairo Hustle podcast. I am your co-host Luke Millett and here's your host Jim Chester. So today we had the opportunity of interviewing Dr. Sean Powers and if you want to know more about the nurse and the chiropractic profession, stay tuned. All right, uh, so we have a very special guest with us today, Dr. Sean Powers coming in from sunny SoCal. And Luke and I are coming in from Grand Junction, which is on the western side of Colorado, which I like to say is where no one lives. And we moved here to hear the birds chirp. (laughs) So you're episode number 204. And uh, we're really excited to have you onto the show. And we connected at Mile High number eight, which is t-shirt is for Mile High number seven. But Mile High number eight, we had a chance to actually meet each other. And it was so nice to meet you. Thank you. I felt the same. 204 episodes. Hey, congratulations. And thanks for your dedication to our profession in doing that. It's awesome. Well, as we were talking off camera, it's fun. And uh, yeah, why, why do some stuff in your life that doesn't add to the quality of your fun? So this is a lot of fun for us. And, you know, sharing your story today will be a lot of fun, too, because we'll do some reminiscing We'll do some storytelling and we'll give some, uh, hopefully some walk away advice for people so they can uh, really make some impact in their life going forward. That's what it's all about, right? Moving the human race forward. That's my mission in life. Find it, fix it, and let it heal. (laughs) I think that's a Clarence Gonstead. It is. (laughs) That means I pay attention to this chiropractic world a little bit, Um, but yeah. Um, it's really exciting to have you on to our, our show today and leading in like we always do on our Cairo Hustle podcast, we ask the um, amazing guests that we have to share their chiropractic story and what influenced them to become a chiropractor. So if you could do that for us, that would get us uh, off to the right foot and uh, our audience will be happy to hear your story. Well, it started a very long time ago. It started actually when I was two years old. So I was two years old and my father died. And yeah, and it wasn't um, a car accident or anything tragic, like, you know, unexpected. It was unexpected. And it was statistically what happens to 580 families a day in the U.S. and most of North America. And what that means is, is that his first sign of heart disease was a fatal heart attack. So he left the house that day. All seven of us children were left behind, never expecting to be without our father. So my mission in life as I grew up, I wanted to choose a career, choose a path that would prevent dads from dying. I almost had a motto, like no more dead dads. And as time went on, what I discovered is that, you know, not just dead dads, but uncles, aunts, you know, I just was driven to literally have a career that could potentially save people's lives. And what it did was it found me at that time of day and, you know, my age um, that I became a a nurse and um, I went to school in Davenport, Iowa, and I got introduced to chiropractic my very first night out in Davenport, Iowa. I met a Palmer student. And not any Palmer student, it was a DE Palmer student. His dad was a DE teacher. So I got dipped, bathed, you know, whatever you want to call it, in the philosophy of chiropractic. I had my first adjustment 24 hours after arriving in Davenport, and I continued under chiropractic care every since that day. To this day, I don't miss getting my spine checked every seven to 10 days. So over time, I graduated from nursing school because I had a course, a path, a commitment, and I worked in ICU. And in one day, I worked a double shift, 16 hours. I saw 12 people die, just like that, one after another. And I'm not even 20 years old. And I'm thinking, 
I wanted to save lives. And this is obviously, you know, I was in ICU because that's where the sickest of the sick came. That's where, you know, I felt like I could do the most good, but it wasn't really what people needed. It was so I woke up one morning and I just had this thought flash. I need to go to chiropractic school. And within months, I'd applied, I'd moved, and I was back in Davenport, Iowa, enrolled at Palmer College of Chiropractic. So that's the long way. Loss of a dad, a mission to save lives, seeing 16 people die or 12 people die in 16 hours to chiropractic school. And since graduating and becoming a chiropractor, what are some things that you do differently or what are some things that make you unique from other chiropractors? I would say because I have a degree in nursing in practice, that really almost gave me credibility and a trust factor that a lot of people who were maybe skeptical about chiropractic or whether or not um, they could trust a chiropractor, my degree and, you know, my RN certificate definitely helped that. So in my early days, and even to this day, people will reference, and I always, you know, use that in all my bios, that I am a former critical care nurse, because when you are at a bedside, and somebody's last breath is being taken, or maybe your hands are inside of you know, their body parts trying to save them. I've worked open heart surgery, I've worked all forms of critical care. The reverence for life that you have and the reverence for how the body works, I think is far beyond somebody who's never been in that situation. And so I would say that makes me unique in the fact that I've experienced a lot of loss, a lot of death, and I've seen a lot of really sick people that is fundamental to my drive and my purpose to change this world with chiropractic. And I also saw you speak at Mile High this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, Are there any other stages that you've gotten to speak on? Oh my gosh, I am so lucky and so blessed. I, I have really been in um, many countries. I've spoken um, in Scotland, in Spain multiple times, in the UK, in multiple areas. Well, Scotland is part of the UK, but, um, you know, but Birmingham, London, et cetera. I've spoken in Mexico. I've I've been in Australia. Um, I've been a Parker team teacher for 20 some odd years. And um, yeah, so a lot, Texas, uh, you know, lots of different states. Colorado, you know how Danny and I got to know each other? So for those of you who might be listening, if you don't know Danny Knowles, who does Mile High, I had a philosophy group, and it was called the Chiropractic Warriors. And Danny and Joe RV would come to my group sometimes. And then when I left the state, Danny had started a group, and that's what birthed Mile High. So even after I left Colorado, I came back to, to Colorado to speak with um, Danny's um, program. So, yeah, I've been blessed all over the world to share what I love. Well, I'll have to uh, direct message you and uh, take some tips on how to get more stages. (laughs) You know, I think it's interesting. Um, My mentor was Jim Zigafuz. And I hired, I've always hired coaches all of my life. Even to this day, as a coach, I have a coach. And um, he came into my practice. He observed. I paid him like $2,500. And this is way back when it was a big investment, but I wanted input. And he watched me do my workshop. He watched me adjust. He looked at my stats and he said, you know what? You don't need me. We need you and you need to come out and you need to help spread the word and spread the message. So I would say if you want to get on more stages, that's the connection piece. You know, who do you know? Who knows you? And, um, you know, he knew I was like on a mission. So uh, he brought me to Parker. He literally, the first time I ever spoke outside of my office, he put me on a stage here in California years ago, and it was probably 2,500 people. It was one of the bigger normal Parkers before the Vegas Parkers. 
And uh, he gave me 15 minutes of his stage time and asked me to tell a story that had happened in my practice. And then it just kind of took off from there. People asked me to come. So I think what you're doing now is like you are speaking on stages all over the world. You just get to do it from the comfort of your own studio, right? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're spot on. And I, 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 I just admire you for um, 38 years of service in this beautiful profession and helping so many people and taking that, that charge from SIG and going out there and doing what you didn't even know what you're capable of doing yet. And then, you know, transitioning from nurse to chiropractor to coach to influencer. And, uh, you know, the stage is uh, definitely for those that uh, are chosen. And I think that when you get chosen, it's about showing up. And it's not just about showing up, it's about transcending a message to the audience and giving value to people. And that's what's so special about it. It's not like watching a television show. It's, it's, it's being inspired and then meeting that person and being able to say, hey, let's grab a meal or hey, let's, if you're into like drinking, let's grab a drink. And I think that it's a good way for people to actually meet that celebrity status as well at events like that too. And to really build a relationship with people. And, you know, I, I've been to that places and had the honor to speak on some stages. And those people that saw me speak that first time, they'll still reach out to me like three or four years later and just connect with me. Today, a, a young student just graduated, reached out to me. He's like, hey, um, I want to be involved with what Cairo Hustle is doing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you, you probably had that happen time after time where it's not even like the immediate impact, that gratification zone. When you finish speaking, you're like, who's going to come talk to me today? And like, how am I going to like help somebody today? But people, that's kind of what resonates with people when they get off stage. You're like, somebody's going to come talk to me. I'm going to get five people to opt into this text code. And people are going to download my PDFs and they're going to ask for my slides. And then you're like, huh, three years later. Oh, yeah. By the way, I saw you speak at Mile High 8. It was awesome. Can I work with you now? And if you notice, when I was at Mahai, I did not have a landing page. I did not have an opt-in. I didn't have an offer. And that's always been how I've operated. I feel like I am on a mission. If I can help you, you'll know that I'm, you know, it would just happen naturally. So um, that's sort of my operating system is that the people who are attracted to me, they'll come no matter what I do. And I would say to you, what you're saying is, we never know how far reaching something we say, do, or think today affects the lives of millions tomorrow. And one day I was at Parker and I was walking down the hall at Vegas and this guy comes up to me and he goes, you probably don't remember me, do you? And I was like, you know, honestly, I don't. He said, you did a consultation with me because part of our packages of team teachers, we would do consultations with people. And this is long before I had a coaching practice, but I asked him a few questions and he shared a story. I was ready to quit practice. I was ready to fold in. And you asked me three powerful questions that changed my life. And it's 10 years later and I'm a huge success now. So I'm with you. It's like, I just have a message and if it, I hope it saves or change or shifts or makes manifests for somebody something that they need. And I'm not attached to that outcome. I just deliver what I need to deliver. That's cool. And that kind of leads us into the next question. What are some of your favorite mantras or quotes that you live your life by? There are two quotes that I love. One is by George Bernard Shaw, and he says, the true joy in life is to be used for a purpose, recognized by yourself as a mighty one, instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of grievances and ailments, complaining that the world will not devote yourself to making it happy. And so like his point is, is that if you have a purpose and you have a drive and you're not whining and you're not complaining, that you will leave um, a legacy, that you will have a candle that will be burning brightly throughout your life. It's a long quote, so I won't say it all, but look it up. And, And then it says, so you will have this candle that will just slowly flicker out, but will ignite other people as you end your life. And so that quote has resonated for me. Since 1982, well, probably 83, I created a folder for my practice that I would put everybody's important paperwork in because we had, you know, paperwork back then. 
then um, that quote was on the inside of the folder. And I started every workshop, you know, trying to help people to find their health so they could live their purpose. And then the second one is by, um, oh, I forget who it's by, but it's called Success. And it's just basically that the definition of success can be a good garden patch, a redeemed social condition, a loving caring child and that I use that quote a lot too because people get trapped in what success means and they beat themselves out and they they set themselves up for failure and you know John Wooden says if you did better today than you did yesterday if you did your best that's success so those are my three favorite quotes I love it because it exemplifies um when we think about what it means to have connection with ourself and what it means to have reverence for knowledge and what it means to transcend that to others. And I think a lot of times people are, um, they want the cliff notes of life and they don't want to live it. Um, they, 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 they want like the infographic with that, that quote on there, but they don't want to read the book to find it. So what we do with this uh, podcast, when we ask that question, it gives us a little bit of, uh, I don't know, somewhat of an emotional uh, leverage to say, you know what, that was a really good thing that we heard and our audience is going to benefit from that because there's a reason that you started every workshop with that. There's a reason that you started every new patient uh, packet with that because people that got into that understood where you were. Mm -hmm. And that's the greatest thing to connect with, you know, knowledge and uh application because knowledge is power but knowledge without application is just words on a paper so it's really cool to empower people with the message you know and i'll just share with you something that really resonated with me one of my favorite spiritual teachers is pema chadron she's a buddhist nun and i was listening to um her book unstuck and i listen to it periodically or I'll, i recommend it to clients a lot and um she was talking about the best book we could ever have is our life if we're paying attention if we're conscious if we're learning if we're you know um you know because the buddhist is always on the path to enlightenment right so that was um because sometimes people in my family will say you know, don't you ever get tired of always learning things or reading things or like, you know, they, they think I should be done by now, I guess. I don't know why, but <laughs> I'm like, I'm on a mission and everything has meaning for me and everything could teach me something. And when I heard that, now I feel like I have an explanation. I'm writing, you know, my life is a book, right? And I'm learning from it. That's brilliant. Yeah, she's powerful. I love her. So how do you think the world would change if everyone started getting adjusted regularly? Well, I think it would change exponentially more beautiful, more awakened. Um, it would be healthier. It would be um, calmer, more peaceful. I think that the first thing that has to change before the world can change is that we have to get more people in chiropractic school because there's seven and a half billion people on the planet and there's only 75,000 chiropractors. So, um, yes, I think the world would be a better place. It would be kind of like that Louis Armstrong song, if you know what I mean, right? It would be like that. So as, as we move down and edge towards BJ Palmer's chiropractic utopia, where do you see the profession going in the next 20 years? Um, I think we'll see more diversity. Like, you know, when I graduated from chiropractic school, there were 250 um, people in my class, but there were only maybe seven women. And a year to five years later, there was only myself and one other woman in practice. So over the last couple of years, we've seen more women. We don't see many people of color in our profession. We see, um, you know, most of the schools are in the United States. We have a big drive for the um, Scotland School of Chiropractic to be open. Like I've, I've done a lot of work donations and things to help them get their funding. So I would hope that we see more diversity. We see um, more, um, maybe less internal fighting, right? 
And um, more, I would think we'll see more acceptance as the power of chiropractic, right? As people want to be more vital and healthier. So could you tell us maybe who are some of your heroes? And if you had to pick one person to have lunch with or coffee, who would it be? Just one person? I'm a party <laughs> girl. I like a big dinner party. All right, one person in chiropractic? It could be anyone, any one of your lifetime heroes. Hmm. Well, that's a tough one. I would say I would probably want to have lunch with Jesus. You know, um, yeah. and only because of what he went through, what he gave up, um, what his father was and is and does. So I'd probably choose Jesus. And who are, who are some of your other heroes that you've looked up to over the course of uh, your life? Well, as I said earlier, Zygafus is my mentor, right? So in chiropractic, um, I grew up in the days of Zygafus, Reggie Gold, um, Dick Santo, so um, Fred Barge. And, you know, I have been around that and, and um, have many a meal with those men and have enjoyed that. Um, you know, I guess I would say if I could have lunch with a chiropractic couple, I'd like to have it with BJ and Mabel. <laughs> you know, I would just like to hear, you know, just how they, you know, how they thought. They thought very differently than most people in that day and age, right? They mm -hmm. took actions in a different way. So, yeah, I think that would be a really cool conversation. Um, for me, when I think about heroes, I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of studying. Maybe I even have a board of directors, you know, in my mind. And what I look for people, what makes somebody a hero to me is somebody who's willing to get out of their comfort zone, to do something for the greater good, who's like thinks differently and acts differently. And they make different decisions. So I'm always looking for that kind of input into my head, my heart. Yeah, I think that that's really interesting. Uh, just hearing about, you know, sitting down with BJ. I think there's a lot of chiropractors out there that would just like, you know, jump the line and pay 10,000 bucks to get to the front <laughs> and to be able to have that conversation. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that anybody that could craft the green books and anybody that could start a revolution with a radio station and become friends with Barnum and Bailey and learn how to put on the biggest show in town, which is the Lyceum and learn how to network with the other influencers of like the socialites in the world and to travel around the world before like real, like domestic travel was a thing and to go around and explore and to do all that cool stuff and to collect swords and, you know, all the artifacts that that guy collected and have an alligator farm in his house and <laughs> all these cool things. And if anybody, you know, wants to dive deeper into that world, uh, BJ Palmer is just extravagant and uh, such an icon. Well, I'll share a little story with you. When I was in nursing school, the last year I rented an apartment and the um, person who owned the house, she was the curator at the museum, you know, the museum down the street. And, you know, now they have, or they used to have a whole wing on the Palmers. So like when they broke down and tore down um, the house and the greenhouse and all of that, they moved a lot of stuff into the museum in Davenport. But if you like up from below the bottom, like some of the green books, the stories that are in there are so fascinating. And I, I think it's what, when you kind of elaborated on how, what he did and how he did things, I think everybody should really tune into that because it is, if you want to grow a practice, you want to be successful, you have to know how to connect with everybody besides your practice members, besides your brothers and sisters in the profession. And that's how you become an influencer. And that's where you get great ideas and um, templates or, you know, like the drive, you see the drive, right, of people. One time I was in uh, St. Bart's. I was on a cruise. I got up in the morning. I opened up my veranda door and I stepped out and there were yachts everywhere. 
But listen to this. There were yachts, and then there were yachts that had boats on them, and then yachts that had boats, helicopters, jet skis on them. So there were literally classes of lots, right? So I'd say, you know, poor, middle class, the rich of yachts. And it made me think, I wonder what the guy who owns the yacht, who has the helicopter, the jet ski, the boat, it's like so much more than the other yacht that if you only saw that one yacht, you'd be like, wow, that's an amazing yacht. But then when you saw the levels of yachtness, if you want to call it that, I'm thinking that guy thinks differently than the other guy, right? You made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession. This week's episode is brought to you by Imaging Services, Cairo Thin, Cairo Moguls, Mahalo Wellness, Cairo Health USA, The Goodman Factor, Chiropractic Rocks, Winner's Edge, Cairo Tax Pro, and Digital Hustle. Let's hustle. Yeah, and I, I think we could reverse back to your opening comments when we first started the interview with you today. And you said the first person you met was into DE. And I, I don't know if that resonates with everybody out there that might listen to this. They might not know what DE means, but I think that if you could elaborate on that and why philosophy is so important to the profession, because I think that to gloss over that early uh, acknowledgement for how you got into chiropractic from the DE perspective, I think you could glean a lot of uh, knowledge to people what DE meant to you and why philosophy is so important to the profession. So DE was called Dynamic Essentials, and it was started, Jimmy Parker was the first guy who did big seminars, and Sid Williams would come to his seminars. Then Sid Williams started Dynamic Essentials, and Dynamic Essentials has a, um, a mantra, love for the sake of loving, give for the sake of giving, serve for the sake of serving. And they always spoke about the principles. Now, for those of you who are listening, if philosophy doesn't resonate with you or you think that's old stuff or there's those philosophical chiropractors ruining things for us, because I know some of you think like that, but I want you to put it into perspective of when I graduated from school, I, from chiropractic, I had a degree in nursing and I was a very mechanistic chiropractor. I was, I didn't know that I truly understood the philosophy. I didn't know that I bought some of the things that we will say about chiropractic, but I learned it at the table. Every time I gave an adjustment, I saw the transformation. I, I was a student at my own table. And then when Zikafus came into my office as my coach and consultant and brought me to DE, that's where I really would say that I learned the philosophy and I started to own it and embrace it. And like in all things of life, if you you don't have a philosophy it's a foundation and you can't just be all philosophical and not be scientific you can't be just all scientific and not have a philosophy and you must have our art so I think it's the triad of all of it that makes us great chiropractors but for me DE um is some of my best friends are still at and in DE and I know that DE has transformed people, move them out of their own way, improve their vision, and allow them to serve more people. And one of my dear friends, Mark Hudson, who does Cairo Europe, um, you know, he has phenomenal seminars there and great practice, and he's really helping the European chiropractor grow with a philosophical base, because it's a drive. I think it's a drive within us that helps the science art and that philosophy is that underlying force. So let's talk a little bit about marketing. What are some things that maybe you've tried in the past that totally didn't work? And what did you learn from those experiences? Okay. I'm going to age myself by telling you this, but you all have to remember, I've been in chiropractic for 38 years. So I have done a bunch of bus benches. They used to do an ad, like you've seen them in the movies, 
I had my little face on there. I had the little grocery cart little thing. My name was on the back of like when the movie theater before the show would start, my office information was on there. Those things did not work because they're passive marketing, right? So if anybody wants to really key in, the best marketing is, is always active versus passive. What did work for me, though, in the old days, they used to have what they called Valpac. And it was a coupon and you would mail it out. And um, literally, I have a story that would move me to tears sometimes when I tell it about a man who brought in this Valpac coupon and he must have been holding that coupon for a year because it was beaten up it was shriveled up and i know he must have debated should i should i not go right and he happened to be a prisoner of war in germany he was a jew he was beat on the back of his head every day and when he came into our office he had had chronic headaches for all the years after that he had no life in his body or in his eyes and he handed me that valpac coupon where I had listed the symptoms. I had the spine and the areas. And he said, can you help me? And he had this thick accent. And within a couple of adjustments, he came in, he took my hands and he said, I have my life back. And literally, I had no procedure, no system, no follow-up, no reactivation program. He held my hand that day. He said, thank you. And he walked out. And I never saw him again. But I feel like Valpac like, gave that man his life. And it gave me like this feeling, like I just get goosebumps, even when I think about it, that chiropractic gives people their lives. And so that was a very powerful thing. Nowadays, I would say to you the number one thing that in marketing, do you want to know what I think works nowadays? Please. By the way, that story almost, I mean. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> we got to clear the windshield. <laughs> I, know. I mean, like, I can see him, feel him, smell him, like, you know, from the first before, you know, his transformation. It was just, I don't know, it was amazing. Anyway, so nowadays, the number one thing is connection, right? I, I really think you have to become a master at self. And you need to be able to communicate, connect. You need, like, if you can't do that, then it doesn't matter what tool you use because you could have, you know how many chiropractors have tons of new people, but they have no retention? They have tons of new people, but they can't go, they're on a plateau. They have tons of new people, but they can't pay their bills. So the ability to communicate and connect, to educate, to empower, to support people is absolutely vital. The best marketing tool you have is your skill sets. Can you give a phenomenal adjustment? You know, can you um, master yourself and that piece? And then the second is, is that the type of care and service you give in your practice is like people are shouting it from the mountaintops. Go see Dr. Sean. Go see, you know, so-and-so. So like the best way to build your practice is to give extraordinary care and give extraordinary service because that will grow your practice as the best marketing tool, word of mouth. And then the third is your team. You've got to have a powerful team who's on mission, on point, effective and efficient. And they become indispensable because everywhere they go, they talk about who they are, what they do, and, and what it does for people. So before you go looking outside, look inside. And then from like things like you do, you know, your, your Cairo hustle and you can do Facebook lives and Instagram and Insta stories and write blogs and teach webinars. Like people want to learn. So again, it all comes back to your ability to educate, communicate and empower people. So I love Facebook. I love Facebook Live. I love webinars in office. Like, depends on the country, the city that you're in right now. Some clients are doing their educational pieces online. Some people have them in their practice with social distancing. But boy, if you don't have that as part of your marketing piece, you'll never be able to grow, shift, and, you know, really change the world. 
without that. Well, I, I, I love what you're saying because what happens, what I really think, and this isn't just in chiropractic, when somebody goes through and they get an education, they become a professional, their ego doesn't develop with their education. And then they get out and they have this uh, ego that says, hey, I'm smart. I'm proven I can pass my boards or I've proven I can become a graduate. And the personality and the connection doesn't evolve with that because most of the time when somebody's going through that, they distance themselves from so much of what regular life is around them that their brain and their education resources outweighing their personal life connection and then all of a sudden they're supposed to catch up after five to seven years of being like an academic professional and then we're like no but you're supposed to be able to connect with people you're supposed to be able to grow a practice you're supposed to be able to retain people and they're like well i'm just wanting to retain some money i just want people to show up to my damn office i want to retain the people that are i'm supposed to get some new patients and then you know i just think that people are out of balance with their ego and their sensitivities and their ideas of what we talked about earlier with their idea of successes. And then they get stuck on this island where they're like, I don't want to ask for help. I don't want to get a coach. I don't want to tell anybody that I'm struggling because my education tells me I'm successful. And then they get stuck in this trap of life and they're like, well, I'm having marriage problems. My kids are not performing in school. Like I, I feel broke. I don't know what to do. And then they get really scared. And I think that that's a place where I've, see where like a lot of really high end professional degrees go is they go from the top when they get that di diploma to like a downward stream uh, or down like a down cycle because they don't know how to connect with their audience which is their practice and then they do need somebody to be their coach and they do need somebody to handhold them and say all right i know you're really smart i know you're really talented i know you can deliver the goods but now you need systems and strategies and we need to get your ego in check with your education yeah, I, you know, here's the, the reality. I think is that um, professional, do you know that the word professional means to profess? I, I, that's what I understand it to be. So as a professional, I profess the benefits of chiropractic. And some doctors feel inhibited about that because they think they're selling. And so there's a difference between selling and serving. And it could be just a shift in your paradigm around that. But yes, I, you know, when people say, um, are there any students in the room, right? When they ask at, at a, an event, I always raise my hand because I've made a decision and an intention that I am a perpetual student, a perpetual student of self-mastery, of my you know, profession of education, of communication, of marketing, you know, all the layers that it takes to be successful. So I think um, it comes down to that ability for loving kindness is, it is hard work to go to school, it costs a fortune, it takes years. And it's almost like we live in a world that it's uh, okay to forget about yourself or to just work, work, work on your practice. And so I hope like one of the things that we see is that through our culture in chiropractic is that, that um, I don't know if I would say it more the feminine spirit of collaboration, of support, of checking in. Are you okay? Right. And if you're not okay, it's okay to not be okay right? It is okay. Um, and I'll just speak to David Russell, who is a phenomenal philosopher and educator in New Zealand. He literally committed suicide. And he was slated to be the president of the Scotland College of Chiropractic. And we were all in utter shock and stunned because like I literally had just been with him a month and a half before it happened and nobody would even have known that he was suffering at that level. So I think ego is a big thing. I think spirit is a big thing, but if you're listening and you need help, just know it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to ask for help. So, you know, we are 125 years old and we've been predominantly a male dominated profession with a lot of bravado and a lot of I'm big and, you know, like my practice is big and I, right. Am, am I wrong in that? Right. 
and and that was where we needed to go to get to where we need to be. But yeah, I just so I don't even remember what your question was. I'm riffing off of what you said. But ladies and gentlemen out there, it's okay to not be okay. It's a part of our life. It's what we learn from the experience of falling down, breaking down, things not working. They're not mistakes. They're part of our learning lessons. Well, this is the power of having an empath interviewer, because when I connect with our audience and our guests, um, it's just so special because we get a chance to diversify the conversation into whatever needs to be seen and whatever we need to make space for. And I just really appreciate you acknowledging Dave. And uh, we had an opportunity to interview him a couple of times. Um, and, you know, what a special human. And uh, yeah, anybody out there that's really challenged with uh, what's happening in the world, their personal lives, like reach out to Luke, reach out to me, reach out to anybody on our Cairo Hustle team, reach out to Dr. Sean here. I know that it's, a, it's a, like I said, when the four walls are around you, and you feel like that you're the smartest person in the room that failed, that's a really hard place to get out of. So I think that we, we have to just decondition people from feeling lonely and let them know that our voice is open for them and our ears are open for them. And uh, I just, I appreciate you doing that. I've been doing 22 push-ups each day for uh, suicides in the military. And uh, it was supposed to end after 22 days. And I think today's like day number 26 or 28. But I'm just going to keep doing it because we need awareness. And uh, push-ups don't hurt me. And I like it. So. <laughs> and you'll look beautiful because of it, right? So listen, just let me say about Dave is um, they asked a lot of us to write a chapter. And there's a book going to come out called The 33. And um, it will, it's dedicated to Dave and it will be um, part of um, a fundraiser for the Scotland College of Chiropractic. So, you know, maybe we could put a link to that in the show notes or something, because again, his memory and, and his, the lessons we can learn from that loss, I think are just something we really want to share with each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Send, send the link. We'll put it into uh... We'll put it on our uh, actual, we'll include it on the front page of our, our website. Okay, cool. Thank so you. So it'll be front and center. And uh, I'm sure all of our sponsors will uh, be in favor of that too. <laughs> right. And they'll probably give. We'll, we'll urge all of our sponsors to participate and give too. Awesome. We really appreciate all you're doing. Well, thank you. You're welcome. So earlier you were kind of touching on that you're always a student, which I think is really cool. What's one piece of advice you would give to another student? Um, don't go it alone. You know, so like whether you're in school and you're in a club or you stay connected to your field doctor or another person, it's school is really hard because it's hard, right? And it's meant to be hard because it's building your character and your abilities to go out there into the world. So that would be my best advice is don't go it alone. Get help. Um, be helpful, right? And be engaged. And the other piece of that is your vision will be your guiding light. So when we're in school, we could forget about what we hope for in the future because it can be overwhelming, you know, all this stuff. And you've got to remember, when I was in chiropractic school, I worked full time, 40 hours a week as a nurse while I went to school. So um, I know how challenging it can be. So that would be my best advice. Stay in touch with your vision and don't go it alone. And do you think they should choose their school based on geography? Um, I think it depends on the individual. Um, there are some people that do and thrive well in certain climates and don't do well or thrive in other climates. There are some people that need to be closer to their roots, their family, their community, and going far away would be just too disruptive for them and they wouldn't be able to do their work. So I don't think it's... a a yes or a no, I think it's what is right for you. 
Where will you be able to stay focused, to thrive, to manage the challenges, and to come out on the other side? Because, baby, we need you. We need more chiropractors. So whatever allows you to stay the course. Yeah, that's a really fair answer. That's a good one. So at this, at this juncture of the interview, um, we want to share a little bit more about you mm-hmm. and uh, maybe have uh, the question would be, um, what are some of your hobbies um, are you a reader or do you like audiobooks? Um, do you listen to any other podcasts besides Cairo Hustle? Obviously, it's your favorite. <laughs> you know me <laughs> so well. <laughs> That's just the interview ego coming out of me. I'm kidding. Um, but um, what, what do you like to do in your spare time and uh, how do you feed your brain? Well, yes, I love to read and I love to listen. So oftentimes I'm reading something and um, I am when I'm working out or walking or like going through something mundane like grocery shopping or clothes shopping, I've got Audible in my ear. So yes, that, that is a big piece of my life. And I, um, a lot of times what I do is I'll, when I'm doing a workout, if it's in my office, which has been a lot more lately than being able to be in the gym, we just got gyms open a week ago. But I'll pull a book off my shelf and I'll just open it up and I'll see what it cracks open to. Like, you know, just like what's the divine and innate going to tell me on this book today. So yes, I love books. I'm a love, love, love them. You know, like the um, mafia would go to the mattresses. If there's any issues, I go to the books. (laughs) So, (laughs) and from a hobby standpoint, I am in love with Zumba. And Zumba is a dance, you know, workout that can be super intense, lots of fun. So that's one of my hobbies. I probably dance between five to six times a week for Zumba. Yeah, I know. I just like it. It just makes me happy. And then I love my, um, I love walking on the ocean and in the forest. I've always been like an outdoors girl. I've run a lot of marathons. I used to play polo on a horse, not in the water. Um, I like to golf periodically. So I'm like a dabbler, right? I do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And, but if you can have me outside, I'm usually the happiest in my hobbies. That's cool. So where can people go if they want to learn more about you and what you're doing? Oh, thank you. Um, My name is Sean, S-H-A-W-N, Powers, as in the power of chiropractic. So my website is Dr. Sean Powers, D-R-S-H-A-W-N, powers.com. I'm on Facebook uh, pretty regularly. I have um, Dr. Sean Powers is my business page and Sean Powers DC is my personal page. Um, I don't do, I do Instagram kind of inconsistently, not good for marketing. Marketing must be done consistently. Even bad marketing done consistently is better than poor marketing, right? So or extraordinary marketing done inconsistently. So um, yep, that's where you can find me. And um, can I give the listeners a gift? Do you sure, okay, so like um, I have some of my favorite BJ quotes. I have a couple of classes if you're interested in. You can get those at powerupgifts.com because I love to power up your life and your practice. All right. Excellent. Go to powerupgifts.com. And is there anything else we didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? I don't think so, except for... I want to just say this. This is going to be aired relatively soon, right? Um, You're episode 203, and I believe we just uh, released about 175. Oh, okay. We we released two episodes a week. Okay. So we are fast tracking. Okay. (laughs) But go ahead, share it. I just would say, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the world is, do not be defined by your circumstances, the world circumstances. Do not let circumstances steal your joy, squash your creativity, or inhibit you in any way. And the reason why I'm referencing that is that we keep hearing this, like 2020 is lost, 2020 is bad. And I want to just tell you all, you have one moment right here, right now, 
You don't know if you have tomorrow and the past is already gone. So stand in the present, stand in your power and be the fabulous individual that you are making a difference in the world. That's why we keep on doing our show and we keep on showing up and we keep on having amazing guests like you. Oh, thanks. (laughs) Well, we love you and uh, we want you to have a wonderful evening out there in beautiful Costa Mesa. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Luke. It's been an honor. We'll talk to you soon, okay? Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Cairo Hustle. Don't forget to subscribe and check back next week to continue hustling.